Now, we had a lot of coincidences. We didn't. This is why we worked together because we were doing lots of things separately we didn't know about. This is why we came together, you know. Because when you get a marriage, you meet in the middle this bit and then you go off both ways, right? But we met in this middle bit, well, we still kept in this middle bit. And the illness was the thing that split us up in the end. But we didn't split up because we went on working. You know, although she wasn't living, we were still going on holidays and all doing such things like that. So yeah, yeah I was I had quite a good job. I was the director, uh, the, um, the chief photographer of a scientific institution, big photo, you had big photo labs and everything, lots of money about then, this was film, okay. But I got bored with this, so I decided, okay, well I'll go and do something as a, in the evenings. And there was this little thing in Brixton, the South Island Children's Workshop it was called. And they accepted me to do a photography, there was dance and all sorts of things there. Now unbeknownst to me, Joe had got bored with the photography as a high street photographer. And she was doing this children's rights thing quite separately. Now, as I said before, this all starts with a thought. It's very interesting. I decided one year, okay, I'll go round and look at all the children's projects in London. And one of the ones was the South Island Children's Workshop. And Joe was one day a week she used to spend there. She wasn't normally there, but she was there on that Wednesday. And she came to the door, there's all kids around, and she was like the mum, I thought. And we got talking, she wasn't the mum. And we moved in a month later. We, said, we couldn't stop talking, it was extraordinary. But it's this thing where it starts with a thought. If I hadn't said I'm going to go and see all the children's projects in London, we wouldn't be sitting here now. And we thought about this a lot. This is the Carthia Breast and Decisive moment, isn't it, when you think about it? Yeah? And we tried to do our projects so that you would do a thing where there was a stream of consequences. Yeah? Anyway, so that was that. So the first thing we decided was let's set up organisation up. So we stopped working for the two things we would, we still had our day job. See, no one would pay us. And they, everyone does this now. So we got day jobs where we could control the facilities and order all the materials and so on. And then the real work is done from nine to five. And there's a guy who says, if you're an artist, A.D. Coleman, if you're an artist, you're an artist all the time, whether you're giving graves or whatever you're doing. And we had this sort of philosophy. So we set up a model based on the floating foundation for photography, which used to go up the Hudson River, Maggie something the girl's name was, and it was a little floating barge, which was a workshop, and it did exhibitions. Now we couldn't afford a barge, so we got this hospital ambulance, and we set up a thing, and there was lots of um, squats, adventure playgrounds, and children's projects, and all thing. And this was all in the air, this sort of, um, these ideas, you had the hippies and the free schools and so on, so it just fitted in. And Joe was a, I, I don't drive, she was an ma amazing police trained driver she was. Her boyfriend was a policeman. She had all these amazing boyfriends and one was a police stunt driving guy, so she did blah blah blah. So. And you didn't need any money with the hippie thing, it was just extraordinary, you know. And I just explained about the hippie thing, right. Now, no one would sit in cardboard boxes at that period, There's, no, that wasn't done in the street. You all got together and you squatted. Now, what happened with the squatting, and this was the same with the women's movement, there was a whole industry grew up around the squatting, and the same with the women's movement, and you had the bellman who would fix the alarm. Oh, that's another whole thing. Now, when we did the... Okay, yeah, I can do about I've got I've got all the material on that, actually. The uh, photography workshop put out a, a program and we wanted lots of people to help us. And it was actually published in 1976, it was published in the Amateur Photographer. There was a very famous man who did a column every week in the Amateur Photographer. I don't know his name now, but every for months and years he was in this column. And he published this and we got various people call us. And two people from the Half Moon Gallery, which is actually the first gallery in England, was set up by two American students who went back to America. They contacted us and said, that's manna from heaven, why don't we get together? So we got together and we founded the Half Moon Photography Workshop. Now we didn't know then that the Half Moon Gallery was a limited charitable company. We thought we were getting together to form a new organisation, but we weren't. But on the basis of our programme, and some of it is on the back of camera work number one, it's edited down, but if you compare the one in amateur photography to the camera one, you'll see what our programme was. We got 8,000 quid, a lot of money from the Arts Council then. 
and differences started going. These were younger guys, they wanted documentary photography and the feminism was beginning to come in as well, which didn't go down too well at that time. And big differences came. And when we were on holiday, they were just moving into a new building in Roman Road. Because the other one was in Ailey Street, it was an old synagogue, the decommissioned synagogue, amazing place. When we cleaned it out, we cleaned all the walls, and there was all this, this Jewish writing and stuff. And there was a little place upstairs where the women, the women sat separately in the synagogue. And the women were sitting in this little thing upstairs, you know. And we changed, we turned that into a booth to project things and stuff like that. And this was the Half Moon Gallery, was the foyer of the Half Moon Theatre, which is a little radical theatre in Ailey Street. And all sorts of... Pam Brighton, if you know the name, she's in Canada now. She was a very famous director. And this was a sort of Brechtian sort of theatre. And Alfie Bass, do you know that name? Now, he was an actor who did very well in... There was a thing called Bootsy and Stunch, which was a soap opera. But he was quite radical. He was in the, in the um, Unity Theatre, which was a left-wing theatre. But all these guys used to come, and that the plays were absolutely amazing. And they got all the props from out of the street... You want some sheet iron, you go and tear it down from the wall and bring it in, you know, and all that sort of thing. Yeah. But this was... was that precursor, really, to the... Maybe we call it the photography movement in Britain. It wasn't a crop top. Oh, yeah. The photography galleries, which were also... Yeah, now, the first gallery, Sue Davis held an exhibition in the ICA. It's the first photography exhibition they ever had. It was so successful, she mortgaged her house. Now she was. He went on to found the photographer's gallery, which was in the old Lyons Tea Shop. And for many years, you know the Lyons Tea Shop thing, Joe Lyons and Company. They were the sort of McDonald's of the day, as it were. And on the corner, they used to have this all these little mouldings, and it's all in marble. And for many years, there was a little corner there, which was still from the old Lyons Tea Shop. It's not there now, but yeah. And she did really well. She mortgaged her house. Her husband was the tuba player in the Temperance Seven, jazz band. Believe it or not, yeah. But she, she did lots and lots of work. And that is the, that's the foundation. So the second viable gallery was the Half Moon Gallery. Now the first viable workshop gallery was the Half Moon Photography Workshop. And they produced, and we produced, the first journal, Camera Work. Now, the ideas of camera work, one of the historical things I was doing, we were researching the photographic literature, and after the war, there was the... Um, Metropolitan Special, all the, in the war all the libraries were bombed and it was a terrible state and there was a Metropolitan Special Collection set up in 1946. They had this marvellous idea, let's get all the, from the bomb things, let's get all the libraries under the Dewey Decimal System which they used, right? Now photography is 770. Um, each library will designate it as... Right, yeah. Going back to the work that you're doing as part of uh, Joe's right. well, you and Joe's project and, and the archive you mentioned there during your talk about if it rotates in the culture it will eventually be taken on by museums. Just yeah. want to ask you what uh, any brief observations you have about um, the, the the recognition of the lack of it within uh, Britain uh, to the Joe Spence well, not only Joe, the, the lack of recognition of radical work. See, it's out, this is outsider art, and it's not outsider art. Outsider art is worth a lot of money now, and Banksy and people are... Uh, but this isn't, because it still it's, it maintains a criticality that they don't want to deal with. They can incorporate the Banksies and that, it's no problem, and make it into fine art. But they haven't been able to make the Joes, and the disability doesn't make into fine art very easily. And Joe is part of the disability movement, essentially, you know. Because they don't want to talk about the exclusion and the other, do they? Because you, what you build up, what you get in a society is... Let's just start from the beginning. You get a revolutionary society that, or a revolutionary idea that overthrows a dialectic, overthrows another one and becomes an establishment. When you become an establishment, you want, you've got all the things you want. Your group has got... And you want to maintain a stability that is not natural. So you don't want any more ideas in your system to disrupt it. Because if you go to the base and superstructure thing, you get the new ideas come in and they disrupt the form. It's the ideas, the content, disrupts the form and it splits it and it's no longer, it has to turn into something else, right? So what they have to do, see nature 
wants dynamic revolutionary things. It doesn't want a vacuum. It can't afford a vacuum. So to make the status quo dynamic, it has to import ideas from outside. Yeah? But what it can't do is import them neat. And this, like, this is where the um, Open University comes in. This is a classic example, actually. So you get things from outside to ginger up your little Murabun little thing to keep you and your guys all going lovely and having all the money. But you have to depoliticise it. So just as with the Open University, they took the plebs and they stripped out the politics. So that's what you have to do to maintain the status quo. Now we realise this very, the status quo was no good to us because it has to maintain an artificial stability. Well, you don't want that. So this is why you're always outside the system. And this is why Joe's stuff won't probably be incorporated into the thing. Because she's talking about cancer as a political thing, not a medical thing necessarily. You know, she's bringing up all these uncomfortable things. And why shouldn't I have the same thing as the rich? Well, why not? But they don't want to talk about it, do they? You know, so this is, this is the answer, I think, to your thing. Yeah. And she's not the only one. There's lots and lots of people.